babies are always a blessing. Whatever way they come to us, no matter how God chooses to do that, they're His blessing and they're His way of saying to us, I love you. Yes, I see what's going on in the world and I have a plan and you get to be part of that plan. That's what babies are all about. When God entrusts a child to each of us, He wants us to see that child just like He does. Now, when you think about babies and you think about God, how do you think God sees babies? What do you think? Beautiful. What if they have a cleft lip? What if they have a club foot? What if they have Down syndrome? What if they fill in the blank with any malady? What do you think God thinks of those babies? He, he loves them and he loves us enough to give them to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Think about that. Isaiah 9 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. To us a child is born, to us a son is given. A virgin will bear a child. But that child was not born on that day. That child preexisted. So God would say to us, a son is given. The wonder of Christmas is incredible. Cogitate on that. Let God explode your mind with that, and that is what he has in mind when he gives us babies. And so he sees children not just as simple gifts to us, he sees them as arrows that he wants us to cooperate with him to shape and mold and direct them so that they can hit the target that God has in mind for them. Because whenever God gives us a child, he's saying, I have a purpose and a plan for them. And I have a purpose and a plan for you. Look at these words from Psalm 127 in light of that. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man and the woman whose quiver is full of them. When God chooses to entrust a child to us, he is saying, I have a plan for them and I have a plan for you. Like a skilled archer, he wants us to work with him to shape and mold that baby so that they can be used by him in this world to hit the target that he has set out for them. In Luke chapter 1, we encounter two first-time mothers-to-be. And they are really unlikely candidates for God to focus on. You have a way post-menopausal woman and a young unmarried teenager. If either of those women had found themselves in a family way in the 21st century, they would have been counseled to get rid of the unexpected, unplanned for, and some would assume unwanted child, just as will happen to some 900,000 babies in 2009. Imagine what your life, my life, our world, our eternity would be like if either of those moms would have taken the world's advice and done away with the unwanted, unplanned for, unexpected pregnancy. To these unlikely first-time mothers-to-be, even though they knew their lives were going to get very complicated and difficult, 
choosing to end the life of their unborn child was never, ever a choice for them. They were excited and filled with anticipation and joy to be part of God's plan. And as we look at their interaction, we can see how God can use us to fulfill his plan and fill us with joy at this Christmas time as we become part of his plan to introduce Jesus to our world. So a little bit of history before we hit Elizabeth. Mary has just been told by the angel that she's going to have a child. She says to him, that can't happen. I've never been with a man. I'm a virgin. And he said, the Holy Spirit is going to come on you and you are going to have a child out of the norm of things. She is excited. She is humbled. She is overjoyed. And she is terrified. The weight of what is about to happen to her is just beginning to dawn on her. Now think about this. She needed someone to talk to. Who was she going to talk to? That would be a hard conversation to have with someone. Now God graciously gave Mary a confidant. Someone who would actually believe her. Because God had done a miraculous thing in their life as well. So we read in verse 36 of Luke chapter 1. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Now, they didn't have GPS. They didn't have navigational systems. But Mary and her family had been to Elizabeth's family's home. We're, we're pretty confident. The, rel the relatives. But interestingly enough, depending on, on where Elizabeth's town of, of hometown was, and we, we're not exactly sure, we just know the region, the journey would have been 50 to 70 miles. It would have taken three to possibly seven days for Mary to make the journey. We know she comes from a poor family, so she, she might not have had something to ride on. She may have walked the entire time. It would have been dangerous for a young teenage girl to make this journey by herself, but she didn't let anything slow her down. She immediately, as soon as she heard what was happening to her and that Elizabeth was in the family way as well, she went to her because she needed someone to talk to about this. She needed someone that she could have a conversation. But Mary had to leave home first. In my imagination, I, I, I suspect that she, she got up from, from wherever she was and the angel had talked to her, and she hurried through the kitchen where mom was probably making some food. She couldn't talk to mom. She hoped mom wouldn't notice her. I mean, she hardly believed herself what was happening. How in the world is the woman who taught her right from wrong going to believe that she didn't do something she shouldn't have done? I imagine she remembers the whispered conversation she and her mom had as they walked by the young girl in the marketplace who was sitting on the corner begging because she was pregnant out of wedlock. And her mom saying to her, you know, you, you need to make sure you don't do that. We don't do that in our family. She was pretty pleased that mom didn't notice. She kept walking. She left a note by the front door, I imagine, just simply said, gone to visit Aunt Elizabeth and Uncle Zechariah. And this is how Dr. Luke retells this historical event. This is from Luke chapter 1, verse 39. If you have your Bible, you want to turn there. If you don't happen to own a Bible of your own, I'd love to invite you to take one of the Bibles in the pew in front of you. You can turn to page 715 and find Luke chapter 1. We'll start in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. She entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women! 
and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believes that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This totally unplanned, unscripted encounter was totally orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's voice, I mean, I imagine she walks into their house and she says, Uncle Zechariah, Aunt Elizabeth. As soon as she heard her voice, she says, the baby leaped in my womb. Now, a lot of moms tell stories about babies moving around in their wombs. I remember when Connie was pregnant with Rachel. We were starting a church down in Highlands Ranch, and uh, she would be sitting on the front pew, and I would be singing. And I could see her belly just go like this as Rachel was moving to the music. I'm glad she wasn't, you know, piping up to mom, give me some earplug, mom. I, I love pictures like this. You know, you see that little foot there. and There's other pictures of, of, of hands and the back of heads and, and all kinds of things. Babies move around in, in the womb. But this is not your normal baby movement. This is the same word that's used back in Genesis 25 when it says that, that Rachel, the the mother of Esau and, and Jacob, Rachel was, was just beside herself because the babies were moving like crazy in her womb. They were fighting in her womb. It's also used in Psalm 119, verse 4, of a uh, kind of a word picture of the mountains skipping because they're excited about what God's doing. This is not your normal movement. Something spectacular happened here. So that when, when Elizabeth hears Mary's voice, this child does somersaults in her belly. The angel had told Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, that the child will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth, in verse 15. And God had a special plan and purpose for this little boy. Verse 16, we read, Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. While in his mother's womb, at six months' gestation, filled with the Spirit, John heard Mary's voice and recognized her as the one who would bring the Savior into the world, the Messiah, the one that he was sent there for the express purpose of introducing him to the world. And he jumped and he kicked for joy. When I think about Christmas, I have to confess that oftentimes I get excited about presents. Presents that I'm going to give and presents that I'm going to receive. I don't know that I would say that I kicked and jumped for joy. I mean, my sister used to play jokes on me when we were kids. She would say, I will tell you what mom and dad got you for Christmas if you'll tell me what they got me for Christmas. I was the younger brother. And I would always tell her what mom and dad got her for Christmas. And she, being the older sister, would always lie. And I would be disappointed twice. Because when she told me it, I'm thinking, well, I don't know about that. And then when Christmas Day would come, I didn't get it. But as I think about Christmas, and I think about what Christmas is all about, I'm convicted. Because John leapt for joy because Messiah was here. And he got to tell everyone about Jesus. Leaping for joy. Being 
filled with excitement that Christ is coming and he will come again. And being excited to tell others about him, that is what Christmas should be for us. I mean, think about this. This is a time in our country whose back has collectively turned against God. Whether we like it or not, Christmas is still called Christmas. And we can take this opportunity to tell others about Jesus. I think at this time of Christmas, our prayer should be, Father, fill me with the joy of who Jesus is and fill me with anticipation and joy to be able to share him with other people. People. That's what we need to be about. Christmas is a time that we celebrate Him bringing the Savior into the world. Not just because Jesus has come, but so that our hearts can leap with joy that we get to participate in the line of the likes of John and Elizabeth and Mary telling others about Christ. Now we're going to see the Spirit show up again. The Spirit is involved in this whole thing, filled with the Spirit. Elizabeth says something that is super out of character for an older woman to say to a younger woman. She says, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? God has already done something extraordinary for Elizabeth, and she is grateful. He's given her a child in her old age, post-menopausal years. And everyone knew it. But now, as God brings the mother of the Savior into her presence, even though the mother is younger than her, she is undone. And all she can think is, why me? Who am I? Elizabeth knew that God had done something unbelievable for her already. And now that he's done this, she's even more amazed. The Holy Spirit was at work in all this. He brought about the implantation of the seed in Mary's womb. He filled John the baptizer in Elizabeth's womb with the Holy Spirit. He filled Elizabeth and gave her words to say, and he inspired her behavior so that there was no jealousy. There was no competition. Elizabeth didn't insist on Mary honoring her because she was the elder. There was no talk of her son being the elder and thus being the more important. Elizabeth was grateful that God used her, that God worked in her life and worked through her. And so that when she saw God was working through someone else in a greater way, it didn't bother her. She was just glad to be part of God's plan. And it made her feel even more undeserving. Now, wouldn't that be a gift to give others at Christmas? To see them as more important than us? To pray that God would show them what he wants to do in their lives. And if that means they ascend above whatever position you're in, you're happy because you got to be part of them finding the role God has, them, has for them. Now, John the Baptist gets credit for a, for a sentiment, a phrase that he, that he made in John chapter 3 and verse 30. And he should because he did say it. But John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. But I, I have to say to you, as I have thought about this, I don't think this was a John original. I think he got it from his parents. I mean, imagine growing up in their home. Elizabeth understood that Mary's child would be supreme. And so she said got to decrease. Mary's going to increase. My child is going to decrease. Jesus is going to increase. Zechariah learned the same lesson. And it's a lesson that I think he wants us to understand. 
we are not the stars of this show. Jesus is. And our role is not the most important role. His is. We don't have to be the stars because He is. Our job is to point to the one who had the star who hung over Him. The joy of being part of God's plan frees us up from completing, competing, excuse me, and gives us the opportunity to humbly cooperate with God and with one another, whatever God's plan is. So what I see God doing in this situation with, with Elizabeth and Mary is I think he's redefining success. Success is not to gain the spotlight, to grab the golden ring, to, to get the big payday. Success is joyful cooperation. God is calling every one of us into a joyful cooperation. He wants us to fulfill our role to cooperate with him to introduce the world to the Savior. That's why Christmas is so important to us. Because this is an opportunity that people are willing to talk about Jesus like no other time. They're willing to talk about gifts because they're looking forward to getting them. They're excited to give them. Let's give them the gift that God gave the world. Verse 45, we read this, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Elizabeth, because of all that was happening, recognized that Mary was blessed by God. Literally, back in verse 43, she uses the word for, for, for Mary being blessed that means well spoken of. It's a rather ironic word for her to use since almost everybody looked at Mary's pregnancy with suspicion. A virgin conceived? Right. But what she was talking about in verse 43 was Mary was going to be well spoken of because of the child and what the child would do. Well, what's happening in verse 45 when she talks about Mary being blessed blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment is a little bit different because the word in verse 45 means happy or fortunate. So what she's saying is Mary is blessed or happy or fortunate because she believed what God told her and she acted on her faith. God said you are going to conceive a child even though you're a virgin. And through you, I'm going to bring my Savior to the world. And she said, Lord, be it to me as just as you say. And so Elizabeth says to her, wow, you are blessed. Because you believed what God said. And you showed your belief, you demonstrated your belief by how you acted. Mary, like anyone who believes God, and acts on their faith was and will be blessed by God. Her belief was the source of her happiness, her joy. Next week we'll look at what's called Mary's Magnificat. In there she, she sings this 10 verse song that is incredible. And it's all about the joy that she's experienced because of what God has done in and through her and will do for the world because of this gift that he entrusted to her. Now the hard truth for 21st century Coloradans to swallow is that everything is not about us. We are not the star of the show the world does not stop and start because we come on the scene or we pass from the scene. God comes to us and tells us what he is up to and he invites us to believe him and to participate. To put faith to the action of our belief. He has you and me strategically placed to fulfill a specific role found a, a commentator on this particular verse 
that really nails this well. William Barclay is his name. To be chosen by God so often means at one and the same time a crown of joy and a cross of sorrow. The piercing truth is that God does not choose a person for ease and comfort and selfish joy, but for a task that will take all that head and heart and hand can bring to it. He calls us to a task that will require everything we have, which really is a good definition of fulfillment, isn't it? God chooses us in order to use us. When Joan of Arc knew that her time was short, she prayed, I shall only last a year. Use me as you can. Wouldn't that be an incredible prayer for us to begin 2021 with? I have this year. Use me as you can. And the outcome for us in all our service, even, even something simple as a cup of cold water given in his name, is joy at the privilege of getting to cooperate in his plan to introduce the world to Jesus Christ. Bring Jesus to every person you encounter this week. That, I think, is the challenge of Elizabeth's life. Discern what God's plan for you is, and his plan in this particular instance is to, to cooperate with him to introduce Jesus to every person you come across with this week. You are not the star, Jesus is. You are not in charge, the Holy Spirit is. You are part of God's team. Your role? Listen. Watch and cooperate. The great apostle Paul kind of lays it out for us. Sometimes we feel like it's up to us to fulfill God's commandment. It's up to us to, to fulfill God's plan for us. The reality is the Holy Spirit will lead us if we'll just simply listen. And He can use us wherever we are, whatever we're doing. This is what Paul said. This is how he summarized it for us. He says this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God made it. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Did you catch that? I planted, Apollos watered. Neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who makes all things grow. I think there are four steps that he wants us to take to introduce Jesus to the world this Christmas. Four simple things that we can all do first one is simply this. Pay attention. Pay attention. Listen actively and watch. Pay attention to the Holy Spirit in you. He will nudge you. He will bring you across the path of somebody who needs his input. He will draw something or someone to your attention. Maybe Maybe in normal conversation, a coworker shares a need. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit letting you know of an issue in their life. Maybe your response as you're listening actively could be, wow, can I pray for you? Or, or how can I help? And then listen. Maybe if it's a, if it's a big enough need, you can, you can go to some other folks in your in your office who would be of the same mind and say, hey, so-and-so has a need. Would you pray with me for them? And I'm going to take up a collection to help meet that need. Or they need to, they've got a, a loved one who needs to get to the doctor. Can, can we help with that? Actively listen and pay attention. Maybe someone is hurting and that's a way that you can participate. Maybe you're, you, somebody comes to your mind and you think to yourself, I should send them a card. Could it be the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do that? Maybe stop right then and send them a card. Now, I know we could text and we can email, and, and I'm not saying don't do that. 
But don't you still kind of like going to the mailbox? And you open the mailbox, and, and there's a, a, a card addressed to you. And you look to see who wrote it, and you're excited to get it and to read it. Simple touches, simple things. See, we don't have to do all of it. We can water. We can plant. Maybe we get to harvest. It's the simple things that any of us can do and should do. Listen to the Spirit prompting. Listen to what He says to you. Someone comes to mind as you're praying. That's the Spirit. Do what He says. Respond to Him. Maybe pick up the phone and call Him. After you do the first step, which is pay attention, put your faith into action. Do what the Spirit prompts you to do. Do it. There's a third step that I want to encourage you to consider. At the end of each day, or if you're a morning person, the, the morning of the next day, write down what the Spirit prompted you to do. Write down how the interaction went. Write it down. Keep track of it. And here's the fourth thing. This will be the hardest. Email or text me. Tell me what happened. Because throughout this entire Advent season, I want to continue to remind us what Christmas is all about. And I want to continue to remind us that this is our opportunity to participate with God to introduce the world to Jesus. And your stories will be encouraging to others. You are God's force for good and golden and beyond. You are God's force for good and golden and beyond. You are God's force for good and golden and beyond. You are God's force for good and golden and beyond. We are God's army of ordinary people sent out every day in golden and beyond to introduce others to Jesus want to challenge us all to introduce others to Jesus by paying attention and putting our faith into action. Let's pray together. Father, we are so undeserving of the gift you have given us. May we have the, the mind of Elizabeth who realized that she didn't deserve the gift you gave her and she really didn't deserve the gift you gave to the world through her niece. God, thank you for the gift that you gave through both of these women. Thank you for Jesus. Remind us this week, challenge us, encourage us to participate in your plan to introduce Jesus to the world this Christmas season. In his name.